Thanks, Forrest. I always forget my pre-flight checklist. Uh, it's August 24th. We're here um, for a little poll planning pre practice session. So um, I'm used to doing these in um, groups in the AEC industry where we kind of have a bunch of professional builders who are somewhat teed in. Um, and, and just to bring everybody up to speed, Mila and I are also in the process of exploring these kind of processes with other groups like Future Capital and working group. So Mila and I will be co-hosting um, a attempt at something like this tomorrow. It's actually a different part of the process, but will lead to some full planning in those working groups over the next couple of weeks. So we kind of have different networks of energy merging together with some, um, with some massive potential. And um, we're going to have to explore all these, these different relationships and develop shared maps. So I wanted to try to introduce today a process called pull planning. And when we, when we launch large joint ventures in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry that are too big for any one organization to execute on um, in isolation, we go through uh, this pull planning process. And so you could imagine that lots of different people from lots of different expertise come along. Uh, you could imagine the groups of electrical experts and concrete and structural experts and structural steel experts and earth moving experts and architects and engineers and all the different specialties. And each one comes to the table with a, with a unique perspective on what needs to be done over a series of years in order to accomplish the shared goal. And drawing on thousands of years of wisdom and building and construction and combining that with some of the breakthroughs from lean and Toyota production system and things like that, um, the industry arrived at this process of backwards planning that's kind of rooted in some of the lean practices. And, and the industry discovered that when you try to try to figure out how you're gonna accomplish something that's let's say gonna take five years and cost a half billion dollars or whatever to do, if you start at the beginning and try to work forward, it's very difficult for the human mind to grapple through it. And you kind of end up wandering down a whole bunch of different processes and getting lost. Um, conversely, we've discovered that if you start at the end and really center into the shared intention and then work your way backwards, descending through different levels of abstraction, in relatively short amounts of time, you can come to, to pretty, pretty reasonable um, milestone-based pathways to get to get to the goal. Um, so again, I don't know if this will work, but I'm really grateful for you uh, being here to take the time to kind of roll up our sleeves. Um, the last thing maybe before we just kind of roll up our sleeves and dive in is um, people like Hank Kuhn are working with um, different groups and even nations on figuring out how to create shared visions for their future. Um, and so this, this process that we're about to go through um, starts after a shared vision has been created and then really grapples with how to bring that shared vision into reality. Um, so Hank and I have just had small passing conversations on, okay, as we convene these groups, really center in on what we want the future to look like, then how do we backcast, how do we pull plan and then get everybody aligned on a rough series of milestones to bring that into reality. Uh, so before, before we dive in, let's just roll around the room, just do maybe a quick uh, one minute check-in on how everyone's coming in, any particular questions or curiosities you have uh, uh, around the process, but let's just take maybe 60 seconds each just for a, for a quick check-in. How's your, how's your heart and soul? Any, any particular Thing that's alive or inquiries around this project and then we'll uh, we'll dive in and after about the 10 minutes that'll take so let's see uh just to i guess model that i'm coming in um, balanced uh, and full of potential there's so many streams of energy moving i'm feeling so grateful i'm feeling curious feeling emergent um, and just really excited to see how we can we can merge these streams of energy together. Um, Ken, could we bounce to you for a quick check-in? Sure. Um, my heart is good. 
My soul, well, I have plantar fasciitis in my right foot. So uh, half my soul is not doing so well. Uh, it's been pretty painful and um, really a drag after two years of lockdown to be stuck at home, not really being able to walk anywhere, or go out for any length of time. Um, but I'm doing what I can to stay buoyant and informed and getting in on checking on the Zoom calls and checking with people. And um, I'm really curious to learn more about what's going on here. I've uh, followed a little bit on the uh, the tech streams, what's happening, but not a lot. So I'm really here just at Jordan's invitation yesterday of, you know, hey, if you want to make it up to this call, here I am. Happy to see Milo again. It's been a while. Michael, good to see you. Hank, as always. Jonathan, we met on one of our calls and Vincent. So I know a few folks here um, and just happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks. Forrest? Sure, <clears throat> as well. Uh, I'm feeling good, I'm energized. Um, uh, the process sounds very exciting in terms of, for me, is something to learn in terms of both how it's been applied and the rest. So looking forward to that. Really a pleasure to uh, see and meet you this way, Ken, briefly, having watched many in the OGM messages and had that um, pleasure of reading. And uh, um, I think having met almost everybody else and looking forward to Hank getting a chance to connect at some point. So I'll pass. Fantastic, thanks Forrest. Um, Marianne? Hi everybody, and nice to meet all of you again, but Ken, you're new, I can't wait to learn more about you. Um, I'm coming in with um, excitement because I was seeped in Lean Six Sigma and process stuff my whole career. So I'm curious to see how this all goes. Um, personally, I'm, I'm feeling like one of those Chinese artists, you know, they have plates on sticks. I have a lot of plates going right now, <laughs> but I still want to be yeah. here right now. So. Wonderful. Thanks so much for making the time, Marianne. Uh, Mila? Hi, um, just a logistical question, Jordan. I couldn't access the mirror board. I, I request an access. Hi, everyone. I think I know a few of you. Ken, it's lovely to see you again, and Marianne and Forrest. And I think we met Hank together in another mapping exercise. And hello to everyone else. Um, I'm very tired. <laughs> I've had very few hours of sleep. It's been... Um, going on so fast at the moment at very rapid rate so i may not be able to stay longer than i'd like to so i have to leave 15 minutes to the hour and then hopefully i can come back in an hour's time and over to jonathan thanks for that well this is going to be great i i declare it i'm all ears i pass it to All right, thank you. I've been watching this develop for four years now with Jordan, and um, I'm looking forward to see the continued uh, evolution, development, growth, create spontaneous creative additions, and the determined effort that all combine to make something work, and the people that I'm, I'm, I enjoy meeting people. So I come very happy to continue the process of meeting people. And on a personal note, I'm pondering how our involvements, our connections, our hopes, our dreams, our history combine to create a sense of call. Uh, the divine inspiration, the human interaction, the inspiration of others, it all forms the sense of call in our life. And I'm at a point in my life where that has become important in a different way than it's been in, in the younger years. So I'm excited for that reason too. So let's um, pass it on to Michael. Michael may be away, we'll bounce to Hank. Yep, here. Um, oh, Michael's here, all right, beautiful, hey Michael. Apologize. Uh, I am um, less than, than camera ready, but I'm going to come on camera anyway, just um, running around and 
dealing with some stuff, um, but I, my, my heart is here, my ears are here, um, and I'm very excited about what might come out of the session um, and, and future sessions and what's come out of past sessions. Um, so great to see all the, I, I will be here even when you don't see my face. Thanks. You look, and I'll pass to Hank. You look beautiful and camera ready, Michael. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank well, I think I heard my name, so uh, let me say something. <clears throat> I've been following Meth Project since uh, more or less the beginning. I'm very excited about what will come out of it. I really liked the way William expressed uh, the desire to create a sense of calm in our lives. Uh, I think uh, most of the people I know are working towards that with the big question marks and uh, my question mark as well. Uh, I've got a call in my life, um, but it needs to be uh, shared with others. I think the Meta Project is where the share it. Uh, so I'm really eager to see how this uh, goes on. Uh, I'll pass the word to Vincent. Hey, everyone. Uh, I know most of you, and nice to see a few new faces. Um, I'm just excited to see what, yeah, what this format is and what we can create together because I know individually all the people here are pretty incredible. So hopefully that there's an exponential in what we do together. Horace, did you go yet? Yeah. I did. Thank you, Vincent. Who am I missing? Is it um I think I think we hit it. Anybody left out? Okay, beautiful. All right. Well, shall we dive? Um, let's let's develop a couple uh, rules here. I'm gonna have um, so we have a few different things going here. Um, we have the chat, we have a HackMD up, and we have a Miro board up. Um, HackMD lets us do collaborative note taking. Uh, the Miro board will let us do mirroring, and the chat will let us do chatting. And um, I'm not going to be able to watch all those simultaneously. So, um, Jonathan, may I request your your help in tending to the HackMD and and just kind of um, doing some collaborative note taking through this? Yep. Okay, fantastic. And then um, I see a few people in the mirror in the mirror, Ken, Marianne, etc. Um, so I just invite help and collaboration um, on on kind of filling out the mirror as we go. It'll it'll be I think fairly intuitive. Um, so feel free to, to kind of help and collaborate in the mirror and we'll go live. And then um, would anybody like to um, volunteer to kind of help help watch the chat and just bring into the conversation at the right time anything that gets spoken out that, uh, that can, that can uh, need to enter the room? Sure. Okay, great. Okay, great. To, yeah, you yeah. let's have, yeah, Marianne, why don't you use your intuition just to kind of keep an eye on the chat. Yes. And if you see okay. anything that doesn't get spoken, just speak it out at the right time. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to try to balance uh, explaining the process to a great enough degree. Let me um, share my screen here. Okay, great. All right, so this is uh, this is a basic pull planning board, um, and I'll explain how the how the process works. Like I mentioned, um, things in Lean, Six Sigma, Toyota production system, etc., are rooted in this concept of pull systems as opposed to push systems, and uh, the beauty of pull systems is they align with with lean philosophy. And when, when this um, technology usually hits industries, it usually discovers 60, 70, 80% waste. 
Um, so for instance, uh, the industry I came from construction, when they started analyzing it through this lens, they were looking at you know, somewhere between 60 and 70% labor waste overall on an industry-wide standard. Um, that's, that's pretty common. Um, in my analysis and many other people smarter than us, we might think that the human industry, kind of the human system on planet Earth, is also something like an 80 or 90% waste industry where the vast amount of activity that we're engaged in isn't actually producing you know, throughput of what we want. So this system works by um, attempting to align everybody on kind of the overarching vision and goal, um, which, will, which will start with up here on this large post-it note. Um, I'm gonna just pull in a quick proxy for that that might be good enough for us to start with for the sake of time. And then you'll see over here on the left side of these board, these descending elevations, 50,000, 30,000, 10,000, 5,000 ground. So those are basically meant as uh, elevations or levels of abstraction. Um, and so you can imagine that if we're flying in an airplane over a field at 50,000 feet, you see only kind of significant details, major contours, major geographic features. Um, and so it's just a very high level overview. And then you can imagine that if we drop down to 30,000 feet, the detail would start to fill itself in. You'd see a little bit more, drop down to 10,000 feet, and then all the way down at ground level, you're, you're right stuck in the weeds, right? And you can't see what you can see at 50,000 feet, and you're surrounded by an endless array of detail. Um, so... The pool planning process works by um, centering out to the, the furthest distant vision or goal, and then working backwards at each level of abstraction, and starting to fill in those various levels of resolution. Um, and we'll, we'll dive in just to the practice of it, but what we're going to do is we're going to, we'll spend maybe, let's say, 10 minutes or so just centering out on the vision and intention goal. We'll start at the 50,000 foot level and go, okay, if we, were to, if we were to work in reverse and pick like five major milestones that mark the way to the goal of the kind of world we wanna live in, what might those be? And you'll get these big kind of salient features of work. And then what you do is you then drop down to 30,000 feet and we can zoom in, right? So if we had at this top level, five levels, we could then zoom into these two and go, okay, and if we were to fill in, in reverse, five different features of work just between these two, what would those be, right? So you, you then start focusing in on these blocks. So after a, couple, after a couple levels, you'd have five with five filled in between those, and you'd have an approximate path of 25 milestones to get there. If you then drop down to another level of analysis and started filling those in, you'd end up with the same thing. So what you end up with is a more and more granular milestone-based path marking the way towards the goal. Um, does that kind of broadly make sense? And are there any questions as I pause before we go into the next step? Marianne? No, I'm good. I'm making sense. You're good? Okay, beautiful. Is everybody roughly tracking with the logic of how this works? Martin, can you so post what, links again? Yeah, I can. Um, hi, Pete. Hey, Jordan. Hey, all. I can do it too, okay. Jordan. I can share oh, this. That, that'd be great. Thanks. And if you could grab the HackMD link as well, Jonathan or Marion, that'd be great. I'll just drop that one in. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> Okay, so I, so everybody's got kind of the rough rough intuition for for how this works, and and just to spend, we, we I did a brief intro, but to to take two minutes just to visualize this with something that we could imagine, the kind of the kind of flow that we'll get into is the idea of okay, if our, if our intention is a a house that's a suitable dwelling place for our family to flourish, and we were to back plan that, right? We might say that the last, with five major milestones, we might say that the last thing we did was place kind of the final furnitures and fixtures. 
It might say that before that we could place the furnitures and fixtures, we probably had a roof on it. We might say that before we could put the roof on, we had to have something to put the roof on. So we had to build the walls before that. And what did we need before the walls? Well, before we could put walls up, we needed a foundation. And what did we need before the foundation? Well, before the foundation could go, we had to you know, repair the earth and make sure it was stable. And so then when you look at that and, and forward, you go, okay, well, to build a house, we need to stabilize the earth, then build the foundation, then build the walls, then put the roof on, then put everything inside the house, right? And it's just a very simple five milestone way to build a house. And then you start diving into deeper and deeper levels of granularity. All right, over to Forrest. Sure, thank you and thank you. So I guess mine is jumping up. I see you have the intention listed as worksite earth. And if that's the, and so I guess my first question, is that the intention that these first five um, post-its are about? And then the uh, question that kind of goes with that in terms of clarification is, if I was thinking about worksite earth and humanity and all that on it, then I start thinking about things like energy and water and food. And that seems yep. to be a little bit different than a house uh, in terms of tangibility. And uh, so I just was seeking clarification about that. Yeah, great. So, so we'll go there next, and I think it'll make sense. But, it, but if you were to develop a house in which your family could flourish, you'd have to include in there water, <laughs> you'd have to include in there energy, and you'd have to include food in there, right? And so those, those things all, that's kind of the beauty about this holistic view is it forces you to go, okay, well, we've got this beautiful house constructed, and we didn't pay attention to the water and the sanitation, we're not going to flourish there. So, so very much your intuition is right on track that every single thing required to flourish, we will need to address in this plan, which gets, which gets difficult, but so, okay. So, so I, I corrected that statement to say, what's our intention for worksite earth? And I'm gonna take a little shortcut here. I'm gonna say, I think I've talked enough with the people um, on this call to say that, you know, if our intention is something like love, we want for all the inhabitants of worksite earth to flourish. And that requires a whole set of things to happen, right? And instead of us spending too much time on that today, I'm gonna to start with a rough proxy that's already had you know billions of dollars of work and time go into it and have been agreed on by 193 nations. And that's, that's the UN SDGs. And I'm not saying these are the right ontology, but I'm just saying they've been agreed on by a vast swath of humanity. So I'm just gonna kind of read these out, right? And so if, if we're creating our intention, um, 180, 93 nations have said something like, you know, we want no poverty, we want no hunger, we want health and well being, we want quality education. We want gender equality, we want clean water and sanitation. Uh, we want affordable and clean energy. So this is, uh, look at that for us. We've already hit your, hit your nodes. Um, we want meaningful work and growth. We'll have to define what that means. Um, Industry, innovation, and infrastructure done in a way that helps and not harms. Reduced inequality. Sustainable slash regenerative cities and communities. Responsible consumption and production. Um, regenerative living systems slash climate, let's say. Flourishing life below water. Flourishing life on land. Peace, justice, strong institutions and partnerships and cooperation 
to bring this into reality. Okay, so so this we can kind of reflect on this any way we want, but um, let's talk about um, maybe there's also some things here like um, like no corruption and injustice, whatever. Um, so we can kind of go through this, but I but it's just an intuition. So. What, is there anything substantially that's missing here? Um, let's just take five minutes and and kind of center in. When we when we reflect on something like this, what's flowing from the heart of love, the elimination of the things that cause unnecessary suffering and injustice, and the establishment of the things that are needed for flourishing in life in any community. Is there anything any significant gaps or flaws um, in kind of the intention that we're setting here? Marianne? Yeah, it feels like, um, I mean, you've kind of said it, but I don't know if we should emphasize it. So no dominion over nature, no extraction, no exploitation, no extinction, no colonization. Like, I don't know if you need to emphasize that, but we are so in tune going that way, <laughs> the way the system is set up now. So I don't know, my thoughts. Yeah, so, so let's say no extraction, exploitation, um, human system realigned and reintegrated with living system, something like that. Does that kind of cover that concern, Marianne? Yeah, that should, yeah, thanks. Okay, um, Wendy? Um, what turns up, having written a paper around one of them, poverty and a state in the US, what turns up when you're tasked to do with one properly and you let people talk enough, the other ones just turn up anyway. So once you just start on one, the others almost always turn up. Well, once you've got yeah. a little bit of volume going. The thing is, if you try and do all of them at once, it doesn't work. You actually have to start with one and let them sort of grow out and join them up. Um, and that was what I ended up having to do. I'm thinking this is nothing about the environment, but I looked in there and there were, there were stories about cars and houses and all sorts of things that were unnoticed um, starting points for other aspects of the problem. So you can have confidence that you start with one that's meaningful and the others turn up is my point. Um, yeah, but then you've yeah, got to give it as well. So it's how you approach it, not not expecting trying to do all at once because that just doesn't work. You start with one and then notice the others and get them as spinning plates around the initial one. Yep. Great. Um, Forrest? Yeah, actually building um, directly on what Wendy was just saying, I'm wondering if there isn't something that is kind of overarching over the top of this, which is um, essentially a systems view of life. And basically what the systems view of life means is the systems thinking portion is that uh, we're focused on relationships, um, context, and patterns. And then in terms of what the intrinsic nature of life is, that life is constantly creating and maintaining communities. It's inherently intelligent. It's inherently creative. And it's inherently regenerative. And that basically within that 20 or 30 words, you actually have an overarching thing that, that validates what Wendy was just saying, which is since everything is interdependent and interconnected, depending on where you start, you can get to anywhere. But this yep. gives a potential framework. Okay, great. So, so yeah, we can we can incorporate that by saying something like a heart of love would want the systems view, human system reintegrated into the living system with inherently right related and regenerative overall overall elemental. So I think we're we're aligned there. Mila. Yeah. So also building on Wendy and Forrest, this, the overarching title for me is redesigning. A meaningful life because all of that encapsulates life um, to Forrest's point. But I also would like to invite us to consider how we phrase this. I know the UN's SDG talks about no hunger, but, you know, um, how about making that in terms of potentiality rather than problem solving for hunger? 
So in this case, it would be, what if every single person was fed? What if every single person had well-being instead of fixing hunger? There's a completely different shift in perspective and it allows for vast creativity in, in how to achieve that. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, so we could start to reframe those. That's really helpful. So we could say, you know, what if every person was fed, had well-being, had the opportunity to develop into the fullness of their potential and flourish, was equal before society and law, um, had abundant access to clean water and sanitation, energy. Uh, just to add to that, Jordan, basically coming from the system's view of abundance rather than scarcity. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. So I, I, I agree, and I think there was lots of hands going up of reframing this in terms of potential, potentiality as opposed to problem solving. Um, so the two, two ways to, to get at it. Thank you, Mila. Um, Bill and then Wendy. Okay, thanks, Jordan. Um, <clears throat> so, as I'm as I look at the goals, you know, we could say yes, we embrace the overarching everything. Let's do everything, and they are very good goals, right? But I think what Forrest is referring to, and what Mila kind of stated, is that. Not only can we reframe them in positive terms, but I think we have to look at the sine qua non of the goals. Um, if people don't work together in partnership and combine their efforts, none of this can happen. So it seems to me that number 19 or whatever is done on the bottom here, there was a partnership for the goals. I saw in, uh, you see that in the Wikipedia list too, the bottom one is partnership for the goals. If we don't develop a mechanism to partner and bring in the human intelligence and creativity and what Forrest is talking about and the positive outlook that Neil is referring to and what we would all start talking about, we would be talking about things that are needed in a combined effort. So we're kind of rolling into what Lionsburg has been built to be and that is uh, an aggregating of human creativity without individual ownership of that, but to have a, a so, yeah. stewardship owned process to actually make that community effort a reality. That seems to me a very reachable goal in what we're doing even here today in this exercise. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, agreed. Okay, uh, Wendy. Um, yeah, I think everything I wanted to say is already is just been said. So I just want to put an exclamation point on uh, Mila's share about reframing things positively. Um, there's just so much behind that in terms of how we then ask questions and what kind of problems we're trying to solve. And it just right from the beginning frames things in a way that sets us on a, a different path of thinking and problem solving. So I really appreciate that she threw that in there and I just wanted to make sure we we hold on to it tightly. Um, it it right. really will, it's like setting the golf ball on the tee and hitting it slightly differently. In the long term, it's gonna have a huge effect. So thanks, Mila, for that. Jordan, I just wanna okay. add what, what Ken Homer said, um, to care for the children of all species for all time. Maybe that'll cover it. some of it. Yeah, I said all generations of life up here, yeah, all species for all time. Okay, great. So so that was great. Um, so we just, you know, we just did uh, two yeah. decades worth of work in, in 20 minutes, right? And, and mm -hmm. so we, we have this reframing of the general understanding of the problems and needs inherent in any community of life. Um, Bill brought in that we need unified and cooperative, cooperative action towards Mila's 
redesigning meaningful and abundant life for all. Mila, Mila, I butchered that, sorry. Um, that's rooted in love for all generations of life, for all species and all time through a systems view that reintegrates the human system with the living system. Inherent as part of that is right relationship and regeneration across time and space. And then we can frame our what ifs that I won't, I won't um, maybe take time to do them all right here, but what if every person was better, every person had well being, every person had the opportunity to develop into the full fullness of their potential and flourish. What if the water was clean? What if the air was clean? What if the land was clean? What if we, what if every community of life had what it needed to advance towards its potential and flourish? Um, okay, so so we can we can finish converting this, but how is everybody feeling? Like uh, however you want to phrase it, but spiritually, energetically, like is there a reasonably strong field being held here? Gil, hello, welcome, nice to see you. Thanks. Sorry to be late, and I apologize in advance. I'm going to have to leave top of the hour. Um, uh, uh, I would invite us not to have any negative phrasing in this thing. So the no corruption yeah. and yeah. no extraction, just take those out. The, affirm those in the positive, don't state the negatives. Yeah, thank you. Uh, restate in the positive, beautiful, love it. Thank you, we'll, agreed. Well, restate as positive or just take them out because there's a, the, 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 the whole mood of everything else is very different than that. So that's all. Um, just, transparent, and accountable organizations and institutions, something like that, maybe. Well, could, could I ask a question? And maybe you said this before I got here. Um, yep. There are two ways to do this kind of thing. One is very, very high level mega statement that encompasses everything. And the other yep. is the laundry list of everything that we care about. And I think the second way is risky. I agree. Gil, what's your, uh, what's your, uh, we, we took a stab towards some of these high level statements, but you, uh, you made one in one of our other meetings. Do you want to throw out your? Well, I've got, I've got two. Um, one that I posted in the chat is what if we acted as though we actually belong to the living world and each other. Okay. That's up in the chat about half a dozen up. And the other is a spin on Bucky's hundred percent. And give me a minute and I'll find that. All, all uh, may, this one, what we've got here. Make the, make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage of anyone. Yeah, and the, and the variation would be, hang on, let me get it back up in front of my face here, um, uh, is to not say 100% of humanity, say 100% of humanity and all the beings with whom we share the living world. Beautiful, yeah. Which, which makes it long, but gets at what we're all trying to say here. Great, yeah. Okay, so I, so I think we're I think we're all aligned on this. Um, does anybody feel out of alignment with this? So we're, we can restate all these positive. We can we can work on our statements, but I think the the spirit and values that are being reflected, um, we're fairly aligned on. Is there is there any significant objections to now advancing towards how we start to pull this into reality? Uh, Wendy? So what I'm thinking at the moment is that for growth there's tension and change. So there's something here, and I don't know how we bring it in, about the process of negotiating and holding all the differences that is part of well-being, and it's not a cakewalk. <laughs> um, so that's, that is nature. Nature's always, you know, things are growing and things are decaying and, and what looks like it's sometimes wrong is sometimes just the nature of nature. And um, I, I just hold that lightly. I don't know how that appears. I don't want it to be negative, but you know, we do get tsunamis. We do get all sorts of things that the, the world throws at us and not every species lasts forever. And there's something there about the tension from a wellbeing point of view is just holding this, um, I guess, march of life and what it turns up to be over time in a way that's rich and not disabling. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's not great. something you could easily put in there, but I'm just saying that it's not something that we should forget because it's not all what you call a bed of roses. There's life and death yeah. in all of that. Yeah, great. 
Thanks, Wendy. It's not bad. Okay. It's, it's part of how things are. I, I started a uh, note for general notes up here and just, just captured that. So there's a process element to this. Okay, great. So, um, so I'm going to return to a very simple concrete example that's different, but of a house, right? So, so what we've just done is we've designed a, a house for our family of humanity and all beings on earth to share in which we have all these positive statements of the basic things that we know are required for life to flourish, right? So we've, we've centered into that, that reality. Okay. So in, when we're trying to transform a space, we have this notion of where we are or the current present state, and then the better and higher future state that we're transforming to, right? So when we just articulated that world in which what if every person was fed and had well-being and had the opportunity to develop into their potential and flourish and blah, blah, blah. Then if we were to analyze the current forces and conditions and realities on worksite earth and what square into the most brutal ones of those, we would see that there's a massive gap, right? That's not our current reality. And so that sets up this chasm that's present in any of these human endeavors where we have to then grapple with, okay, how are we going to transform this work site, Earth, from what it currently is towards this best and highest shared potential. Okay, and then I think um, I want to honor Gil's statement by also saying that if we're going towards the best and highest intention and greatest good that we can articulate, it's important not to make that too specific or it gets dangerous because we're kind of concretizing the absolute. So, but we've created this field. Okay, so is everybody comfortable starting to uh, go into seeing if we can learn how to do a little bit of an uncomfortable process together? Um, there's no objections. I'm gonna I'm gonna advance. Okay, great. Um, I want to highlight a tension here, which is there's going to be two types of thinkers in the room. Um, some thinkers are going to want to hold this highest intention and figure out how it um, how it all flows. Other people are going to be feeling stressed because it's too big and abstract, and they're going to want to pick one element like hunger or um, making sure everybody has enough food or making sure everybody has well-being and dive into that. Um, so I'm going to ask anybody who's kind of working on the bottom-up basis or wanting to dive into a specific thing just to kind of kind of hold that but let us just start at these highest levels and and descend down and and see what happens um i'm gonna also follow intuition here and take a little risk so uh mila and i can start practicing for our future capital session tomorrow and so if we were to define some of the key like roles or actors or key different um, personas that will be impacted by this transition. So if we're transforming the entirety of earth from what it is to something else, and we were to start to look at some of these key roles or different personas that might be involved. Um, and I'm thinking things like government might be a persona, um, business might be a persona, uh, individuals might be a persona, um, you know, plants and animals might be a persona. Um, what, what other quick personas could we populate that we will want to look through their eyes to see this process with guilt? How many do you want, Jordan? Because we could do thousands. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, 10 big ones. Okay. Just just the big buckets, just to capture the lens. Well, civil society, academics. Water. Families and cities. Air. Soil. Food. So.
That's 10. It's 10? Any, anything big we're, we're missing here? Maybe cities for communities. Because there's something about the level of, I, I say granularity, you've got to be able yeah, to see thank you. And like a little country town is a community, both yeah. of them are communities or collections of communities. I was, I was recently looking at the map that had mapped 4.5 million basic communities on earth where people live. Right? <laughs> families, maybe there's, you know, maybe there's a billion families, 4.5 million communities, fair water soil. I'm going to, I'm going to add one more, uh, that's, that's a little bit related. I'm going to throw microbiome on there. That's it. Where would, uh, would the energy fall into one of those? Mm. Well, mm. I think, I think we should add it for us. Thank you. I think okay. Of, yeah. okay. uh, in, infrastructure. All right. That's a good one, Jonathan. I like that. Okay. Yeah. So we could, we could go in. We can go into depth, um, and uh, but we're we're just we're just playing here. Okay, so I'm going to invite um, I'm going to invite some people to um, embody these different sections, um, if you're willing to, hmm. um, and to to look at. So as we're engaging in this process, um, I'm going to go back to a very concrete building analogy. If we're if we're doing this and we're going to build a reservoir. And we look at the people in the room. Some of them are electrical experts or instrumentation experts or structural experts or engineering experts or environmental experts. And so when you're in this room, you have this diversity of viewpoints. Um, ooh, okay, I'm gonna interrupt myself to acknowledge Vincent's, Let's, let's call this past and future generations. Great, Vincent. Okay, so you, you have this diversity of viewpoints, right? And something kind of really interesting happens from that. And um, Nila and Kilu were pinging me about, um, about that this week. So, um, Wendy, would you like to make a quick comment? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking of this in terms of, if I say complex adaptive systems, um, that there's sort of two lenses here. You either look at all the objects at the end or you just look for the interactions. And in the end, the simpler path is to look for the interactions. So, um, cause you, this all becomes not a, not a machine. It becomes very organic and everything interacts after a while, but there's different types of interactions. So there's sort of like a people to living other living beings interaction, if you like. Um, 100%. Yeah. And what happens is if you, you look for the objects at the end, what happens is you end up saying, well, what sort of government is that government? And then there's a billion types and what sort of individual is that individual? And it's, you know, a billion, you know, types. Yeah. Et and so, you end up getting really messy. So I'm trying to put us, I guess, save us some pain from complex systems point of view. Quite often you can simplify the types of interactions like, you know, human to other non-human thing, living thing, if that makes sense. And then you don't actually have to, um, you, you end up not having to specify all the objects at the other end. Um, and I know it's a flip, yeah. but it, yeah, <laughs> it's worth thinking about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so there's, <laughs> We're, we're this is an experiment right we're going to see how it goes and we're learning the limitations of our ability to think together um so completely respect these differences um i completely respect that everything is um we could look at it from a just pure energy perspective um i'm, I'm trying to merge in um, streams of thought from building from um, intuitive systems from constellations work just to kind of um, see if we can replicate something so Let's go down the path a little bit and we'll learn from it and we'll do better next time because we'll have lots of these to do. Okay, so so drawing on um, constellations work and different things that, that Mila and Kilu have been advocating for, um, I'm gonna ask a few people to, um, which, which, of these, which of these key voices are critical, key voices or lenses are really critical that we have someone looking through, probably most of them. And is anybody feeling, um, let's get some names on here. So we could all try to look through all these lenses simultaneously, but it's difficult to do. 
So if we assign people to looking or representing the voice or the spirit of these different things, we, we might have something interesting unfold. So if you guys are okay, I'd like to, I'd like to practice that. Um, so is anybody feeling called or feeling like they could see through or speak from any of these particular lenses over the next, it's like occupying a persona in a game. Jonathan? Civil society. Okay, so, uh, okay, so Jonathan would like to, okay, so Jonathan, you're gonna, um, just over the next period, you're gonna try to really embody that intuition for what that is and how it relates to things and in and, and that relational way that Wendy was just looking at, um, kind of take that lens. Anybody else feeling uh, capable of looking through these lenses or representing? I'm happy to be um, air, water, soil, maybe even the microbiome. Okay. I think uh, we could, uh, they're, they're different, but uh, I agree. Macrobiome and microbiome are very closely related actually. Yeah. Thanks again. So Ken, from that lens, are you perspective with, are you uh, okay with Marianne representing both of those? Okay, great. Thanks, Marianne. Um, who else has a lens to look through? I'm happy to represent families. Okay. I'll take past and future generations. That's that was when Wendy, Wendy what, M. What, what, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, was that Hank that said no, past that was, and future that was generations? That was Ken. Ken, okay, Ken H, great, thanks, Ken. Jordan, this is Kilo, why didn't you assign me somewhere? Uh, Kilo, why don't you take energy? Sure. Jordan, I'll take business. Oh, I was gonna, that's okay. That's the, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I fit, so. Judy, would you be, Judy, would you be willing to take government and institutions? I have a lot more experience with institutions than government, but sure, <laughs> I guess. That, that's what, yeah, that's why I think your experience in large institutions would, would equip you to look through that lens. It, it's probably better actually than, you know, I was not a business person per se. I was a technical person in big business. So that's probably, that's probably a better fit. Great, thanks, Judy. What do you mean by academy? Yeah, I was wondering because that. Because there's a portion, there's a part of me that sort of, in touch with some of those professional association communities, but I, yeah, I could well, that's a, you, universities. Yeah, okay. When, when do you? I'm thinking kind of uh, the totality of universities research. Okay. I think Vincent will do the pattern. Uh, uh, Vincent. Vincent. Structure. Sorry, it was taking. Okay, great. Vincent, Vincent's rolling with infrastructure. Okay. Um, What's really interesting is individuals and plants and animals are still on the table. <laughs> I'll go for individuals. Uh, who who was that that just spoke? That, that's Michael. Who just spoke? Up. Thanks, Michael. Oh, you, you're perfect for that. Um, who would like to uh, represent plants and animals? Anybody? Okay, I will. Uh, I will speak on behalf of plants and animals. Then, all right, great. Okay, cool. So everybody kind of got their assignments. Okay, so let's I'm take. Oh, sorry, Need someone for food, maybe forest. <laughs> you can put me down. House. Forest, forest, and, food. Okay, great. And communities. Uh, communities. All right. Pete, would you mind putting your uh, systems mind to communities? Uh, no. <laughs> No, as in you refuse or no, you wouldn't mind? No, I don't mind. Okay, great. Okay, so let's take, um, let's take a couple minutes of, of silence here. Um, we're about to get into looking at a, a very complex 
system that is none of these parts, that is only the whole, and yet we can see all these different parts. And so let's, let's take a minute of uh, silence and kind of meditation and let's try to slip ourselves into these roles. And anybody who's listening that doesn't have a role, um, just you can look from the whole. Do you mind so let's, maybe giving us, Jordan, what the next question or task or framing so, will be so that I can, I can start to bring that in? Yeah, so what the, what the next task okay. is for us to be is going to be to dive into this whole planning process where we're trying to discern how the system transformed. And because it's a total interrelated thing, we're going to do that through seeing what happens is if we each look at it through these different lenses. Um, so we're going to dive into the full planning next. And so what, what I'm hoping we can do here in the next couple minutes is everybody kind of lay down your own persona. And if uh, so, I'm representing plants and animals. So over the next two minutes, I'm going to try to slip myself into the persona or spirit or lens that can speak on behalf of plants and animals and feel and experience the world from that lens and how they relate to everything. So I'm going to try to be thinking about um, how I feel relative to Michael, who's representing business individuals or Bill, who's representing business, but from the standpoint or spirit of plants and animals. So let's take two minutes of silence here. Um, just kind of try to feel into that perspective or lens that you're gonna look through for the next hour or so. It's kind of the classic walking in someone else's shoes metaphor. What does it feel like? How do you empathize? How do you view the world through that lens? With, with compassion and love, both as someone who wants to flourish and someone who wants others to flourish. All right. Okay, beautiful. So it took us an hour to kind of introduce the process to align on a shared vision and intention for our future that I think is, um, is everybody um, is, is wanting to move towards. And then we, we, invited ourselves to think through the different related things that are present in that pool. And now we're going to drop into a working session when we're, where we're going to try to think through from all those different comprehensive perspectives and relationships, how the system transforms. Um, I got a suggestion from someone in the chat that before we do that, we take another couple minutes here 
um, and write down from the perspective of the persona you're representing five to 10 primary needs of the group you're representing that would need to be met or fulfilled in order for that vision or attention that we share to manifest itself. So Bill's gonna write from the perspective of business, if we're gonna end up in this completely regenerated and realigned human system, what are five to 10 key needs that would need to be met? I have an organizational question on that. If we're all creating lots of post-its, but we're coming from the direction, um, should we have a identifier that we use, like a Let, number or something? Yeah, um, let's do that. Thanks for that clarification. Let's just do that as notes to ourselves. Let's not do that on the mural board right now. Does that answer that for us? Let's just do that offline, yeah, yeah, each person. Yeah. So I, I, do, I think we want, I don't think we want to necessarily make that visible. So what are five, 10 key, key needs? Okay, how's everybody doing? Does anybody need? Uh, can can I say you're trying to talk, but you're on mute, good sir. Sorry, I'm writing in a different window. Um, yeah, I just needed the minute. Thanks. Okay, yeah, let's take a couple more minutes.
Okay, how's everybody doing? The nod to Ken. Forrest, how are you doing? Good, okay, beautiful. All right, great. Okay, so now, now we've each got our, um, we've each got kind of our lenses that we're looking through. We're going to start at this 50,000 foot level. And so um, what we're thinking of is we're envisioning this transformation from where we presently are here in 2022. And we're fixing a time sometime out in the future, however you like to vision that, 10, 20 years out, where we're living in this different world. And again, we're going we're gonna to think backwards and try to envision, okay, what, what was one of the last things that happened before that flourishing and abundant world in which every being had the opportunity to develop into the fullness of its potential and flourish? What happened right before that? And then what happened before that? And what happened before that? And we're just gonna try to backcast five big significant milestones that mark the major, the major milestones along those and see if we can get anywhere, anywhere near an agreement on what some of those might've been. So before we go into to that, let's take, uh, let's just take another minute of silence or so here. Try to walk out to the future and then just try to, in your, in your mind, back cast and see if you can see, you know, five major milestones that we could celebrate that would have marked the transformation between where we are and where we got to. Those can be as big, as audacious, as impossible as they need to be. Whatever needs to happen in order for so, us to get there. Jordan, I have a clarifying question on yep. that. And that is, how do you see taking exponential change into effect? Because if we're talking about the whole planet, the whole planet won't change in a light switch. It'll actually have places that have already got the wholeness that's expanding. Correct. How do you where where how do we frame that? You gotta just use your intuition for us. So so you've got to. So I, I understand. So I guess how I would just respond to that quickly was maybe milestone two out of five was that, that we had a certain number of prototypes or pockets of coherence that were living it out that the world could see. And then maybe there was some expansion of those pockets of coherence. So that might be one way to think about how the system transformed. And in response to a, another back channel message, I just want to say, um, on these five milestones, we're not going to try to represent each of the different viewpoints here. We're going to just try to get five big shifts, right? Um, just like on a dam, I'm just going to use a dam or a reservoir as an example. What these things would look like is we would say, okay, um, first we mobilized and assigned all the crews and contractors and teams. There was maybe a second milestone where we had reshaped the earth and cleaned out the entire foundation that the dam was gonna be built on and we would notice that. Maybe the third milestone is that all the earth was filled in. That was another milestone we can see. Maybe the fourth one was that all the electrical and instrumentation was completed and then we filled the reservoir. And so they're just these big overarching features of work. Um, so looking at it from the overall perspective, Okay, so let's just try this. Again, I don't know if this is going to work, but uh, let, let's try it and see where we get. Okay, so what, what happened? What was one of the last like significant breakthrough visible milestones before this high, higher intention manifest? What was one of the, what happened right before that? Does anybody have any, have any thoughts or ideas? And let's just be creative and brainstorm and then we'll, we'll merge that we learn to listen because you can use that for you know listening to nature right. listening to other people um listening to our bodies 
Okay, so I'm gonna, wow, that's an incredibly large post-it. Um, it's nice. useful though, because you, it's, it goes across lots of types of transformation. You listen to the rocks, you know. Okay, great. So, so Wendy, um, I'm going to honor that by putting, um, oh, somebody already did it. Great, thank you for whoever's working with me on that. That's super helpful, Wendy. Okay, so um, Wendy, Alfred, I'm gonna ask you, um, so we're starting at the back and coming. Do you think that happened like right at the end before this intention came to reality? I'm thinking, Wendy, I see Wendy M kind of moving it way this way. I'm thinking maybe that needs to happen really soon in order for another bunch of other things to be possible. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I, I think so, I'm, I'm trying to think of verbs, you know, listening. Yeah. Um, you can easily share and you can explore yeah beautiful so if, okay great so yeah okay beautiful so we got listening up on the board as a potential milestone how about something what, what? like um effective alliances toward the end okay. i mean we need to learn to do that but it's not going to be immediate and and along with that is the process of those you know generalization of alliances across multiple cultures okay great so so wendy let's copy effective alliances and then let's let's put another one before that um judy spoke to the process that enables effective alliances so um what we could call that maybe the process of how we ally and federate or something however we want to phrase that but that came before that uh ken yeah, um, I want to say, speaking from the standpoint of both past, present, and future generations, that um, one big change would be seventh generation thinking the way it's actually met by the people who invented it, which is not to think 140 years in the future, but to recognize there are always seven generations walking through time. If you live a good life, you'll know your great grandparents, your grandparents, your parents, your siblings, your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. Therefore, any time there's a decision to be taken, um, you make sure they're representatives from all of those generations present in the conversation. Love that. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Where, where would you place that on the continuum from, you know, zero to 100? Where do you think intuitive we learn to really think long term and multi generationally like that? Um, I hope it's coming soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so maybe put so, that yeah, out I'm like 20. 20 gonna, percent or something like that. I, I will. Let's put that out in the next. Uh, let's put that in the next 10 years. Mm. That becomes a, a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. We recognize that yeah, okay, you know, sure. there's one human family, there's many tribes, there's one human race, and we need to really recognize that we've got to make it work for, for all the generations. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to make an adjustment to this too. Um, uh, hey, Jonathan, um, could you take where you're writing 2062 and make that 100% instead of a date? Okay, great. So um, because we don't know the time at which exponential phase change is gonna happen, um, let's think about this as a continuum from zero to 100%, no matter how long it takes, right? Some of us might think it's gonna be 10 or 20 years. Some of us might think it's longer, but let's just kind of go zero to 100%. Um, so we play seven generation thinking as something that needs to happen here pretty quickly along that continuum before the other things go. Okay, let's get some other, um, some other key milestones on the table. Centralized information and knowledge sources or connected yeah. ones. I mean, somehow we've got to get all this wisdom and actual solid science content and other things in an aggregated mode of some kind. Mm. Accessible knowledge. And differentiated okay. knowledge. That's that's also important from the perspective of academy. So right. it's got to have a whole yeah. lot of difference in there because we need the difference as part of and the scale, tiny to large. Right. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks, Wendy. Um, Judy, where, where on a scale of uh, zero to hundred does that kind of occur? Do you think where we we 
forge these centralized and interoperable information and knowledge sharing a capability. What's our time frame across this number, Jordan? I, I intentionally tried to defeat a time frame, but let's call it a uh, let's call it ten well, to twenty years. But for the whole thing, or for segments of it, because I mean, I, some of these things have been trying to happen for centuries, and they're not there yet. So it's going to take an epiphany of some sort to That's aggregate them. But yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I put it kind I'm, of in the two and a half to three range, maybe. If, yeah, if we want I, to really I, get to the end point, we need to do it sooner, not later. I think, I think yeah, so part of this is the fact that some of those things do actually exist. They just don't exist um, in, at, they exist at a different scale. So it's more about, you know, we've got a lot of those things. They're just not necessarily gathered, if you like. Um, yeah, so they go here with so, these pocket, pockets. The, the, the issue I see is that it's sort of like there are thousands or hundreds of thousands of aggregated knowledge content areas, but mm. they don't know the others exist and they don't talk to each other. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to invite us to, we've, we've got that down. Um, I'm not sure who's on that posted. I can't move it, but I'm going to, I'd like to invite us to take that centralized accessible information and knowledge and move it left um, towards in between learn to listen and seventh generation. That's got to happen pretty soon. Okay, great. And then we'll, we'll get into detail on, on how these things happen. So let's not worry too much about it. What are other big milestones? And again, I'd encourage anybody who's capable of doing it, of thinking backwards. Um, I can go. So I'm, thanks, going, I'm going from the perspective of energy as soon as my screen unfreezes, which unfortunately just froze. <laughs> so uh, we learn where to capture and generate already a Humans learn where to capture and generate already available energy from natural sources that they could put in circular systems. Humans learn yes. how not to waste energy because one of the biggest issues around energy is we consume more than we produce or humans consume more than they produce and they are not in the right relationship, not understanding. So, they, so the other milestone is humans learn how to intentionally see, measure, gather, distribute, and use energy, and how to recreate energy circularly, if you will, you know, kind of from linear, just consume and waste, and instead use, transform, and generate as much as possible of just different types of transformations, understanding the nature of energy um, in systems. And humans also okay. learned how very dependent they are on energy. And so understanding how to manage and manipulate themselves and others in the whole world as energy opened up a completely different dimension of what became possible in inner exchange, interbeing, interflowing, circularity of energetic movements. So from the disconnected linear waste and consumption paradigm, it became this interconnectedness reflected in both material as well as you know unseen realms of the nature of energy. Okay, so um, beautiful, Kilo. So I've, I've created a, a post-it here we can move around called Under, Understanding Energy and Its Types and Flows. And then sometime after we did that, we learned how to capture, generate, and conserve in circular and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll add in that word circular, self-generating. Okay, beautiful. Okay, great. Um, so we have these, these uh, issues related to energy that obviously fuel all sorts of other um, systems. Um. Jordan, this is Bill. I'd like to yeah. propose that from the standpoint of business, we need to recognize that society doesn't change unless the influences in society are pushing in the right direction or, or encouraging in the right direction. And because most everybody of working age is working, everybody is involved in some kind of an operation, and except the independent professionals, where they have some kind of leadership. And business owners, leaders, managers, directors, 
are very influential in creating either a negative or positive culture and influence in the people that work for them. And so to influence the world for change, we need to influence people. And to influence people, we need to get their positive attention and to have business leaders focused on the right things and rewarding the right behavior is going to be tremendously influential in achieving any goals in this entire thing. Because we're talking about this grand movement of humanity here. Okay, so um, Bill, I'm, we're trying to express these in terms of milestones. So, so you you have um, a milestone that's something like at at some point we're influencing people at scale. Um, I think you also spoke to the need to transform the incentives in order to create that influence. Is that correct? Yes. And then um, to create one more thing here, um, I also heard um, this issue of attention. Right. Um, so I'm just going to create this milestone called um, attention slash influence at scale um, that leads to transforming incentives and influence, et cetera, leading towards this, this cultural transformation. Right. So so down there, we're getting towards this um, through line of, of transforming our way of being. Jonathan. I want to um, thumbs up for. What Bill just said uh, basically sums up what civil society needs. And I would place um, distinguishing fact from opinion, encouraging trustworthy behavior. I would place these early as we can possibly pull it off. Um, takes a while for that to percolate its way through aca um, academy and education. So perhaps I'm overly optimistic that we can accomplish it early, but I think it's a, like, like Bill is saying, it, it's a pivot on which a lot of everything else will Okay, so we got we got a note on encouraging trust. We we have another one on um, um, we want to call this, it differentiating or discerning fact versus opinion. Yes. Well, it's discerning uh, evidence. It, yeah, yeah, it's it, evidence based statements rather than. Okay, great. So let's uh, let's keep moving. So, so Wendy, let's take this. Uh, I think I also hear Jonathan advocating that this kind of whole cluster of four needs to move left substantially. So we could kind of shift that leftwards a bit. Okay, what happened? Um, one, of the, one of the key features is that um, on behalf of plants, animals, air, water, soil, um, one of the things that's required is that they're clean and regenerating themselves. Um, so I'm going to put on one of these big milestones somewhere that we, I, I don't want to say this. Uh, I, I think this is worth saying in the negative, but we, you know, stopped um, poisoning slash polluting air, water, soil. More positively, uh, husband our resources better. You know, in this case, I really align with you, Jordan, that it needs to be stated kind of in this way because of the natural regenerative factor of life. Uh, if we get out of the way, uh, it will create that healing. And so if we state it in the positive, as long as we're not losing what has to be eliminated. Yeah, I think some of these are worth stating in the negative when it comes to the tactics, because they're, we say, let's be better stewards. That leaves room for a lot of, uh, yeah. Okay, so, so let's Could you be let's as zoom aggressive up. as eliminate pollution? It feels like eliminating pollution is much 
like sooner than in 20 years. Like we need exactly. to Exactly. I mean, sooner. It, it, we have to start now to eliminate pollution to give the regenerative capacity time to respond. Okay, let's define. Um, so, so I think this is what I'm getting at with we stopped poisoning or polluting the air, water, and soil. Is that why, what you mean by eliminating pollution? Like we stopped polluting the environment so yes. that the regenerative capacity could kick in? Mm -hmm. Yes. To but it needs to happen well, sooner because it's going to take a long time to fix. To state that in a positive, maybe. Um, sorry, Judy. To state in a positive, maybe reduce toxic, human caused toxicity by 95% by X date. It's not going to go away overnight. Again, there's a lot of inertia in the system, but there you um, go. and it's not just pollution. There's so many different levels of toxicity. So reduce human toxicity by X percent by by X date. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thanks, Ken. That's we great want to make, uh, and I guess this is going to be for a lot of them. So I, I'm hoping this is a is a is a foundational question. Do we want to state things as in like not we don't. We no longer want to add to it. Versus, we want to remove from the entire ecosystem, larger, you know, super system, the toxicity by ninety five percent. Those are two very different things, right? So, if we're reducing, that means we're only contributing five percent of what we used to. If we're talking about removing all of, that means we have also cleaned up areas. We have also transformed things that are to currently toxic. So I'm just throwing that out because I think that's an important question and how we frame all of these things going forward. I'd say both are necessary, Wendy. Yeah, I agree. Both oh, are necessary. Definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to make sure we're understanding what we're writing and yeah. which part comes first or second or whatever. I'm just, I'm bringing it up for conversation. Yeah. So for those people who were phrasing the reduced human toxicity, did you mean both? Uh, or the, the question might be, could we just switch reduced for removing and does removing include reduce? And it would seem to me it does. Well, I think um, removing is a, a progressive process because you can't remove all of it instantly. So... <laughs> There's a lot of stuff that won't get removed. Forever chemicals are called forever chemicals because they're there. And it's gonna take a really long time to get those out of the system, but we can reduce the amount we're putting into it as well as remediation efforts to clean stuff up, super fun sites, right. things like that. So it's a both, it's two pronged strategy and both sides are, are required. But that's why I'm sort of advocating for eliminate because you have to eliminate first or you're continuing to add while you're trying to reduce. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, we're, we're a little caught in semantics here, but. Um. <laughs> well, I don't think it's just semantics. I think it's time because, you know, you, we, yeah. we, can't, we can't instantly stop using internal combustion engines, for example. Everything would just grind to a halt. It would be terrible, you know. So we have to have a transition plan. So as we're transitioning, we need to reduce the toxicity we're putting in there, clean things up, and find cleaner, better ways of managing our, our energy and our time and our, our ways of relating. So all those things are required. I'm going to, I'm going to put some, put some, uh, just to take a little stab at this, it might be helpful if we do something like this, it's a cheat, but we could say something like, you know, social environmental regeneration, 25, you know, 50, 75% complete. That kind of contextualizes that totality mm -hmm. of things that need to happen, both to stop the harm and participate in the regenerative capacity. Mm. I'd like okay, to, so we're, yeah, I think we should be noticing now who's contributed and who hasn't, because there's some voices and some people not speaking as much and some, you know, individuals, for example, um, th there'll be some ideas there, as Michael said. So who's on the table so far? So yeah, I'll just add in the um, the soil, water, and mic microbiome. So if we if we're very close to the twenty years down the road, um, the entirety of the work site Earth will inherently know how to continuously create anti-fragile systems because we are inherently intelligent 
inherently creative and being regenerative and operating in networks. But so that's very close to where we want to be. Okay, so um, let's let's create some milestone. Um, we could create some milestone that says kind of like right before this thing manifested, we got to a major milestone where let's say 95% of um, Marianne, help me here. Systems, um, um, regenerative and aligned, or something. Yeah, I, I want to use the word anti fragile because I'm reading that book, which is such an awesome word. Um, Nature is inherently okay, just anti fragile, right? So I don't know if that. Yeah. Okay. So so great. This is a great example of of this backwards thinking. So Marianne said right before there, around the world, we understood how to create these regenerative, anti-fragile, aligned systems. And, and so when we say, okay, you know, we reached the 95% kind of tipping point, that speaks to, okay, along here from zero to 100, there was some progressive transformation of systems from exploitive out of alignment to anti-fragile, regenerative, in alignment, et cetera. So I like that, I'm gonna risk a, I'm gonna, what about like, um, what about government and legislation or something like what, what, is there anything we can see in our minds that happened at some point that was like a major milestone where there was some kind of a, uh, well, if we could get agreement to participate in the UN's SDGs in a more uniform way sooner, that would be part of what would allow people to then pursue the right research to learn how to do it in the, in the developed countries and consider how to provide resources to the less developed countries. Um, but it's pretty snarky. <laughs> yeah, so, so what do we want to, so I like that as a measurable milestone somewhere along here, like before human toxicity was reduced by 95%. We had to have seen something happen where half of the governments and corporations of the world or something like that jointly committed to something, right? There's some big milestone moment that I think you're kind of pointing there to. Yes, they're also sort of the super polluters. So if we could aggressively eliminate and reduce super polluters, I mean, it's known what some of the most polluting industries, practices, and so forth are, the cost benefit hasn't been made to the companies to really mobilize them to do something about it. They won't till they're threatened with being shut down. Mm -hmm. um, to, to get your, building, I'm sorry, go ahead. To get to your government governing question um, from the and from a community's needs perspective, um, I've got decision processes um, that are like we've we finally figured out how to how to make big collective decisions, what to do and what not to do. Mm. And also, yeah, to that's me, there's something about accepting the decisions that you don't necessarily agree with. So holding yeah. difference, so, so decisions that hold difference. Okay, great. So, so somewhere, so somewhere really soon, I guess, Pete, I'm thinking we, we must have figured out how we're going to make kind of decision navigation governance type processes that a growing tipping point of people are engaged in. Okay, great. We, we got some energy going here. Okay, Michael. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm apologize for not being in a, a great place to contribute as much as I should, but I wanted to share um, some of uh, some of the thoughts regarding individuals, which obviously greatly overlap everything that you know. It's like individuals. I was I was sort of bucketing five groups of um, of needs states um goals you know things that are important one being health survival air water food 
um, than love, belonging, family, friendship, um, than safety, security, equality, and justice, than uh, assembly, movement, association, travel, and communication, thinking, learning, uh, and freedom of thought. Uh, and that all of those, I, I can break down still further. Those are kind of 50,000 foot views of, of things that are important that overlap all the other categories, it seems like. Um, so I'll, I'll keep working on that. Um, but I just wanted to, to speak up because I had been unable to speak for a while there. Okay. Um... Michael, are you are you are you on the road, or are you in a place where you can write? Where where I can what? Sorry. Where you can write? Uh, I'm now at a place where I can write. Okay. I'm would Would you mind kind of um so so those were really well thought out, and I don't think we're able to capture it in stride. Would you mind dropping those into the chat? I will. Okay. Great. Um. Thanks, Michael. I I wanted to um. I threw in another high level bullet point here in response to something Kilo put in, which is that before we get X percent of governments, institutions, corporations committed to a plan with funding in place to accomplish it, there had to be this shift in consciousness or paradigm um, mm -hmm. where humanity understands the moment in history, its interconnectedness, and that we shift from a suicide pack of exploiting each other to a massive positive good um, thing. So that's gonna unfold in like this tipping point. Um, and so I'm just gonna suggest there's a milestone where we get, you know, I don't know, 10% or something of humanity kind of operating in this new way that's enough of a political force that shifts. Okay, uh, Jonathan. So because uh, our society has a lot of uncivil aspects um, that trace their roots to education, a lot of what I think is has to happen is uh, somehow showing people that benevolence, um, trustworthy behavior, reasoning, uh, things like that are valuable to the individual. They work for the individual as well as for the global. Yeah, beautiful. So, so, so Jonathan, I'm gonna encompass that. Um, I'm gonna add to this note here on this tipping point strategy, the shift in consciousness or paradigm, the shift in values that would include all those key things you're speaking to. Exactly. And we could imagine, we could imagine that that shift in consciousness is unfolding on a tipping point, you know, from zero to 3% to 10% to, pulling the middle. Um, so, so I think there's good intuition for that, how that flows. Forced? And then, and then um, oh, sorry, Jonathan, at, go ahead. at about the 50 or 60% mark, I, I think would be a great goal to guarantee everyone their basic needs. That, that's impossible right now, but I think we could build towards that and that that would also help eliminate a lot of crime, <laughs> a lot of Okay. Email. Yeah. So, so I'm gonna, email. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that out here somewhere and say, um, uh, basic human needs met for all. Thank you. Freeze up higher, higher level creative expression. Does that satisfy that, Jonathan? Yeah. Forrest? And and and. Uh, encourages people to not commit crime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, reduces uh, attractiveness of crime. Exploitation slash crime. Great. Thank you. Okay, Forrest. Hmm. Yeah, it's so um, not sure where to put this, um, but essentially, I think it's right around the tipping point area, and that would be. 
that life is directly speaking to us. And the way life yeah. is going to directly speak to us is via sensors and our ability to understand what the messages are that are coming from the vibrations of life in all of its spectrum being interpreted through artificial intelligence in a transparent way so that the artificial intelligence becomes an autonomic nervous system of the planet. In that way, then humans will naturally, I believe, move because life is creative and regenerative and intelligent. And so with um, information, then quality decisions will be made and the movement will be much more rapid. Hmm. Yeah, that... I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly add in. So so what Forrest is speaking to is that within say two to three years, our allies will have developed the ability using these web three to have sensors kind of around the world that are giving us real time feedback on the health and well being of the living system. Um, that a combination of human intelligence and AI can interpret. And then Forrest, I, I'm going to add in here something about a, um, I don't know, uh, computer models that can make visible the pathways, um, implications into the future, you know. I think, I think so we also we'll know. Fundamentally, uh, to me, it is a combination of two factors. It is transparency, because that's what this is doing. It's basically making the voice of nature transparent, which is currently not visible to us in many ways. Um, and it's also empowering agency, meaning the source of that, if it's a human source, the source of that data is controlled by the source maker. Yeah, so that's where I, I was trying to put my piece in. So human, set, human sense and networks are noticing what's going on as well as um, the sensors. We actually need the human um, Correct. Now, like because that will give you details that wouldn't be noticed or that there aren't sensors for and that yep, those exactly. are actually feeding towards well-being because the stories we we want to tell ourselves new stories so we need to be noticing what the the collective story is if well-being is one of your aims is that i'm noticing and i'm noticed and yep. um, one is information the other one is a, an input to um human well-being that you've noticed yourself in noticing you actually start to grow as a person so it helps with a lot of other things because we then have the capacity to um be not rational actors but at least more coherent actors so something about becoming coherent actors is senses in the system hmm. yes i'm going to add that um Yeah, becoming coherent sensors and actors in the system. Love it. Um, okay, uh, we got Wendy and Judy, and then I'm having trouble getting things integrated from the text. Uh, Kilo and Bill had some threads going that I'd like to fold in. Let's go to Wendy uh, first. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm having a hard time taking notes and thinking about my my <laughs> the voice I'm supposed to be representing at the same time. So, um, I think one thing we're missing. I, I well, first I want to echo what Michael added, and he's thinking about individuals, and I'm representing families and communities. I believe so. Um, the, it's almost like they, it's a cross section because they need to benefit from the systems working better together. <laughs> like, so one thing that might be missing, a lot of the pieces have already fallen in. One thing that might be missing is um, creating feedback loops for expressing unmet needs. And elements of 
you know, or, and moments for celebration, both. Um, so that I mean, maybe that could be headed by like creating um, deeper connections. So for me, the... it's hard to frame it. I'm sorry, just one more thought, Wendy. Um, it's hard to frame it just for in my for me. It's hard to frame it just for family because I feel like that's so that's such such an important thing for everything. <laughs> So I'm having a hard time. Yeah, yeah don't, don't worry. We're, right now we're just working on high level framing through our different lenses. So don't worry about framing, just feel free to frame it all. So I wanna capture what you said, feedback loops for um, um, both. I'll put it, so, I can put it in. So, yeah, it was for um, unmet, need, and, unmet, unmet needs, needs and moments of celebration. Okay, perfect. I've got that. If you want to modify it, it's right under um, scalable sure. and self seven generate. But yeah, exactly. So we're going to need to, yeah, be able to listen. So before, okay, great. Yeah, just just on that subject of feedback loops, you go down the whole path of um, cybernetics and such. It's much better um, with experience of these things to keep it not. It, while there has to be feedback, the narrative is actually feedback and it's yep. important not to have it X and causal, you know, so X came from Y, but more an ecology of things that happen together. So feedback goes down a very specific path, which is probably not quite the right word. It's about the relationships yeah. well, between things. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. So we'll, we'll get into details on how we do all this. We're just trying to get, get the milestones for now. Um, Ken, thanks, thanks so much for uh, for being here in between your calls. Um, could I take a minute just to invite um, any any pieces or gaps or anything that you'd like to um, get on the board on your way out, if you're still here? Uh, I think this is a really great start. There's a lot of stuff that could go on here. Um, I would encourage people to check out the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, they're Vision 2050 uh, New Roadmap for Business. Really, it's exactly what you're talking about here. They go through and, and start with, how do we get to a sustainable world by 2050 and work backwards decade by decade in nine separate areas, including um, uh, yep. what's there, energy and buildings and transportation and all that. So it's really worth looking at because it's, it's very elegantly done. My friend Bob Horn was the visual synthesizer on that. Um, Great. And uh, I just want to say there, there's one thing that's kind of at the back of my consciousness that's, that's niggling that won't let go, which is power needs to be addressed here. There are people who have enormous amounts of power and incredible uh, egocentricity who are not at all interested in what we're talking about. And they represent genuine challenges to this. So that also has to be figured out. How do we, um, how do we, uh, go up against, you know, the the large defense contractors and the big energy companies who are, you know, they're riding high. They they see no need to change. They're making billions of dollars, and so that's just I don't know how to do it. I don't know myself, but I know that it's there. It's something that very few people take take on as a how are we going to handle this? And until we figure out how that happens, those countervailing influences are going to be very very difficult to overcome as we work on this project. So. It's it's just something that needs to be, you know, looked at and confronted and and brainstormed on. How are we gonna how are we gonna handle this? Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, Georgia Bellin was pinging me about Bob Horn too, um, so it'd be great as maybe a month or two from now, once we've done some more of this, synthesized, kind of pulled in the stuff the World Business Council did to to circle up with them and see if we can can revisualize things in a way that can unite the networks a little bit. So thanks for bringing that back in as well. And I've really enjoyed everybody's contribution here. It's been, been awesome to meet some new folks and see what's going on here. So thank you all and wish you a great rest of your day. And I got to get on another call in three minutes here. So I'm going to go. Great. All right. Have a great Bye. day again. Thanks. You too. Bye. All right, all right Judy. I'm sorry, Judy, you're on mute. Did I get unmuted? 
tried yeah. to click on it. Yeah. We, we got, um, we got you now. I think that there's a dimension of capacity for human change that has to precede institutional change until humans start looking at the world differently and believe they have individually the capacity to change themselves and the things that they interface with, we can't have institutional change. So there's a, a human enablement piece that I see as quite important. And it's very, the people who believe they can affect change have already been inculcated in that by family, social, educational, and other systems. But that's a pretty small percentage of the population that really feels they can influence change. A lot yeah. of population feels they can't even influence minor changes that affect their personal survivability, let alone address issues like where the water is coming from and where the power is coming from and how you connect with people in other parts of the world and all those things. So there's a, yeah. there's a change, change capacity, change agent role, change process that it underlies all of this and cuts across every sector. Okay, great. Um, I, Judy, I'm adding that to this um, second major note we have on this tipping point of consciousness and paradigm that includes both the shift of values, the understanding of interconnectedness and that restoration of agency. Um, and then um, there's also obviously the technology and process to connect rising agents to. Um, so I'm having trouble because the, the notes are getting crowded, but um, um, Wendy M, would you mind just dropping a note in there um, somewhere along that unfolding tipping point of consciousness, um, kind of the technology platforms and process to empower that agency? I think that helps, but I'm trying to get at the almost indigenous culture level of change. If people yep. don't they have individual agency, they don't feel then they have family agency, then they don't have community or neighborhood agency. And I'm concerned about the large portion of the population that feels an absence of agency. Yeah, I understood. Yeah, they're, they're um, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a minute to make sure we just capture these right here in parallel. This, um, to the restoration of agency. And there's a, yeah, we, so we could, we could design a program around that, Judy, right? A, a program around a tipping point in consciousness rooted in some kind of experience that includes the waking to our agency and then the connection to the tools and resources that then equip and empower people to move in small groups and teams to transform their, their local communities, their families. Okay. Exactly. Let, okay. Okay. Yes. So, so we've, we've got that on the board. Um, do you, is that complete enough for you to, to come back to it in a little bit, Judy? Sure. Okay. Um, Kilo. Thank you. So I'm, I'm going towards human soft skills, which will really help effectuate the shifts, these sort of tipping point types of shifts. So one is talking about human emotionality and like the Dalai Lama keeps talking about the hygiene, emotional hygiene, kind of like we brush teeth, except that if we were to be able to take equally good care of our emotional health, we would be able to engage well with each other and with the world from a place that is peaceful, belonging, healthy, not ill, as opposed to right now where there is a lot of crisis and drama. And there are, there are skills and technologies to that, that as people engage that way, they become different. As they become different, then the shift happens because they, they become viscerally different once they deal with the emotional garbage and triggers and all of that. And then the other part is also the valuing of intuition and learning the skills and technologies because it's not it's not just woo woo it there are skills technologies 
very practical uses that can be honed that everybody has some capacity for. And once people learn that, there is a completely different relationship with life as well as relationship with possibility as well as a relationship with agency, empowerment, and interconnection between people. So those soft opening to the soft aspects of humanity, both from the healing of what's you know broken and messy and horrific and therefore creates a lot of the dysfunction in the world, as well as just the empowered use of those skills and technologies which are inherently latently present in humanity but not very well used not very much used great thanks kilo tried to capture that jonathan uh, that was excellent as to judy and kilo and wendy uh i propose that one of our very first steps be to create a way that attracts a lot of kids these days to a fun way to learn these new ways of thinking, managing emotion, um, something, something like a, a game comes to my mind. You've heard me say this a lot uh, because it attracts people who aren't ready for joining the institutions and those institutions aren't ready to help them anyway. Yep. Okay, great. So a way to attract and empower kids, families, you know, it's something that's a that's a lighter way. We're completely aligned there. Thank you. Something about responsibility. Okay, yeah. That um it's it's I don't want it to be harsh, but something about um being able to it's like a pre-step for agency is like that you could have agency it's like an awakening so i guess the gamification is like a pre-step for that but um this acceptance of responsibility for the mess <laughs> and that has to happen at every level okay yeah, great. I'm going to add to this note here on restoration of agency I, I, um, and responsibility. So I, I really understand, I think I understand what you're saying that the, the sense of responsibility and agency kind of move together. Is that, is that kind of what you're reflecting, Wendy? Yeah, first of all, um, there's two flips on that. One is it, you know, this I this move from it's not my fault to everything is my fault. Yeah. And everything my fault feels like it's a step too far. But if you say everything is my fault, and if you follow, say, some of the Hawaiian traditions, and Akila would have a lot to add here, it's the saying, I'm part of I'm part of the stuff of everything, and therefore it is actually, you know, my responsibility, the fact that we're yeah. in and the mess, if that makes sense. So if you yeah, walk down, yeah. yeah, if you walk yeah, down, key, it doesn't work. Yeah, key part of that change in consciousness. Beautiful. Okay, let's go to Bill, and then I want to I want to take a uh, take, take a pause. And Bill, if you could if you could loop back in some of those things that were flowing in the the chat that I wasn't able to get on the board. Okay, um, <laughs> there are uh, so many interactive and complex variables and many of these things we're talking about so i'm going to throw some things out there as um hopefully not excessively generalization kind of based i think that families and individuals um benefit the most when their needs are being met practically and their life and work is purposeful and this is the natural desire is to be purposefully connected to my own inner ambitions, goals, strengths, skills, who I really am and believe that it makes a difference and to connect with other people who I can encourage in their strengths and skills and ambitions and they affirm mine. And in the process, our needs are met and our work is productive for us and for others. And uh, this brings us to this um, idea of work. Um, there are those who say the so-called great resignation, this trend towards uninterest in career, 
is a product of the laziness of millennials and Gen Z people. And I'm sure everything's a factor, right? But I think for the most part, there is some agreement by those who analyze it deeply that there is a dissatisfaction with the world the way it is. And there's a sense of a desire for purpose that isn't found in much work today. Um, I want, I'm not gonna get into all the criticisms that could be levied, but I think that's the factor. And if businesses, and here's the punchline, if businesses provided a sufficiently meaningful place for people to work and met their net needs well and gave their skills an opportunity and their diverse viewpoints and lives to contribute meaningfully to something that they really believed in, then not only would that produce a tipping point change, but it also would provide a competitive market force against the companies that accumulate power and tend to repress the world. They're gonna, those companies will find it's just hard to get workers these days. All the baby boomers are retired with their, with their corporate wisdom and we can't get young people to come work for us in the department of resource exploitation and personal oppression. You know, We need recruits in that department. Well, they won't get them. So I think that this idea of creating an alternative form of business that provides meaning and, and good sustenance, it, it, it kind of brings to mind Mondragon. Jordan, we saw yeah. Mondragon, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. rippling effect in the entire society. And people, they, they and then one last thing, people have connections at work and they think, hey, I have this team at work. It's like a bowling, it's like the bowling club. Yeah. But when they're fired, they don't have that anymore. There's not real community. Yeah. It's a sham community. But Mondragon has real community. And I think if work was different, it wouldn't create an artificial acquaintance community that dissolves as soon as someone leaves. You wouldn't have people having to leave the same way because we believe in a sustainable business model and a, and a community connection. So I think it's all connected in that way. Okay, Bill. Um, so just a, a few bullet points to capture that, you know, families and individuals needs being met, meaningful work relationships, liberation from meaningless work out of necessary to survive, proliferation of these alternative business models, real community and ecosystems, et cetera. So we'll capture that and we'll kind of place it. Um, but yeah, that liberation from less meaningful work into more meaningful work. Also, um, yeah, okay, so, so let's, let's zoom out a little bit. Um, let's zoom out a little bit. We've got, um, some of us have, you know, a little bit of time left here, maybe 50 minutes. So let's take a pause and a, and a minute of silence and let's observe what's happening here. Um, let's observe what's happening and, and kind of reset and see where to go from here. So if you just, just invite a couple of minutes to close your eyes and um, just center. Just breathe a little bit together, kind of reset. Let's try to sense what's happening here and most constructive way to spend the next period of time.
All right, beautiful. Hello. All right, so um, let's just pause and take, let's take a few minutes and just reflect on um, on the process here, what's happening, and how we can make the best use of the remaining time. Um, like I said, I haven't tried this before with um, kind of uh, diversity of perspectives and different professional backgrounds and all that. Um, so you can get a sense of what's happening, I think. Um, but I'll, I'll maybe be quiet. Um, just a couple of us with our cameras on right now. Keely, what, how are you doing? What do you think's happening? Uh, Where are we you. flowing? I, I'm, I think we should put those in sticky too, what's happening, because that's going to happen more. I think we're making very good use of working as a group, but it's a coherent group in emergence where something is emerging through us. And we're all kind of drinking from the same source, but honoring our individuality and whatever strands we bring. And that's a process. And through skillful use of this process of emergence, by bringing us into the space where we're not vomiting what we know and coming from the place of this is what I know from the past and this is what has to be, but instead we're in this generative field because I don't know what's going to emerge next, but I can feel where it's emerging from and so can others on the call. I think that's one point and I'm very excited about that because I, I can see the future very much shifting through that way of engaging at work and in the world. And then the other part is how much is available and how abundantly there is available energy, insight, wisdom, different forms of training, different kinds of diverse background gifts that we are bringing that get liberated in this way where we give the space and permission to engage in emergence in that way. There's an abundance that is underappreciated and underrecognized and I'm ex experiencing it here and it's really yummy. Thank you, George. Anybody else have a perspective on where we are? Sure. So, oh, I'm in a, um, I'm in two places. Hold on. That didn't work for me, but now I can hear. Um, so it's interesting, you know, one of the things um, that's just arisen is wondering what is the real purpose or outcome of what we're doing? And I think that um, for me, that it's happening at many levels. It's happening partly on the level that um, uh, certainly Kilu was just speaking to, which is really a human person level emergence, what's happening with the group. At another level, it almost feels like that there's an intentional seriousness of the whole experiment to see about actually pulling in real information that it, you know would become acted upon. And if that's the desired purpose of the group, that's a different purpose than the purpose of the group is running an experiment, getting tighter understanding or thinking and all of that. So if it's, it's, if it's the purpose to get serious outcomes out of this, then it would seem to me um, what Ken suggested and what we know exists out in the world is a tremendously deep, robust thinking already and mapping already that has occurred over a lot of time by a lot of really smart folks. And it would seem to me that what might be lacking is a survey and a clarity around what might be able to be taken right off the shelf and go through a very similar kind of process and just turn around and say, hey, wow, 
you know, again, it's it's that principle that turns around and says, whatever our impulse is that we want to create, has it already been created? And 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 where do we go with that? So that's just kind of what arose there. And then to follow that, how do we take what we're coming up with and merge with other things that already are covering a lot of it? That's really yeah. hard. What I'm just to respond with, to that for, for 30 seconds, as I've, as I've looked at those frameworks for us, I didn't find um, really the path from where we, you, you can find the big layout of what needs to happen across energy systems or regenerative ag or kind of the big overarching things. Um, when I look at the field of what we just populated around the deep nuance of human systems and, and kind of consciousness and the restoration of agency and some of those things, I think we're form, forming a really rich shared understanding of, of kind of the core movement. And then when we layer in what the World Business Council did, right, those will, those will illuminate like all the big pathways. And I think what we're illuminating here is some of the stock stuff that I was a little bit unable to find in some of those frameworks. So but I agree with what you're saying. What I'm envisioning is over the next, let's say, 30 days, we'll, we'll flush these kind of things out of the working groups and the network of 100 or so people or whatever that is that's kind of moving with us. So we're all aligned. And if we can kind of get that and then layer in those other big pieces, I could see, you know, very short time down the road than having a fully actionable plan that not only has validation from those big thinking groups, but that, you know, a hundred of us can see exactly how we can get there from where we are today, right through those steps into the larger scale. So we really want to honor and, and agree with you that that'll be a key step is then synthesizing all those larger frameworks. And so I, I see us as kind of bridging. Vincent? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, no, sorry, no, of course. One, one, yeah, one little piece on that is that when you speak of working groups, then it may be that one of those important working groups might be to A, identify which of those should be reached out to, yeah. have a path of to reach out to actually invite a representative that actually knows that work exceptionally yeah. well to yeah. um, join um, a working group of synthesis, you know, yeah. 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 a certain yeah. way, not that dissimilar to what way back when 40 years ago, they tried to do with the natural step or they did do yeah. as a really way of where do we find agreement across all of this um, that's actionable. Yeah. Okay, great. Let, let's, if someone, um, if someone's still in Miro, I'm going to stay present here, but if someone's in Miro and we could add a post-it for this working group that would reach out and identify the other frameworks and ontologies that have done this and then kind of guide that synthesis process. And let's put that, you know, somewhere soon in the next six months. Vincent? Done. Thank you. So I just wanted to offer a, a brief reflection. Um, from up until where we are so far today during this meeting, I liked the emergence of what came out of like those different perspectives as well as the different milestones. I wish that um, this process was made more clear. So coming into the meeting, I thought that we were gonna be doing more of a project management, figuring out what's going to be done in the next six weeks. Um, and if I knew we were going to host a sort of interactive brainstorm session to map out the goals of the entire world, I probably would have came prepared in some way, both mentally, but also um, I wonder if we could spend time, you know, preparing before meeting so we don't start from a blank mirror board. There is so much work that has been done both that everyone here, including myself, knows of that I don't think we have the time to pull it into this process. Um, and so I don't know if that was the intention was to get what was on the top of our minds, but I find the need for having, you know, like a second brain where I store this stuff because it gets so complex that it's not going to all come up in a meeting unless I 
am prepared in some ways. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, that that's just my reflection, and and I wonder to model that what what the process would be like for the rest of this meeting to get towards like that six week plan, or is that even the intention for the meeting today? So that way we can kind of yeah, Jordan, even yeah, if it's a fuzzy answer, that would that, be very. That's where that that was where my uh, intuition was going to take us. Um, for next was to say, okay, we've got enough of this field. We can marry it up to other things than to, to dive in and kind of look at the next uh, six, six to 12 weeks. So I'm happy to go there if the group feels that's right, but we have half an hour and a pen. I think that would be a good, a good place to go. Thanks, Vincent. Appreciate those observations. Okay, any other uh, kind of top of mind thoughts? I think we need to do cycles of what just Vin Vincent just said, because I think what happens with emergencies once you start bringing in some of the other resources and some of the voices that were sort of less um, present in the room when we talked to our, you know, 10, 11, 12 personas, um, you probably ne need a couple of cycles of richening and noticing and moving things sort of left and right a little bit and not just believe yeah. that you've done it yeah. in one. So it's not just a single cycle. And also there's something about connecting some of those up as well. So, you know, we may yeah. be able to simplify things a little bit, but there may be some things that really shouldn't be taken off and we need to be um, open to what we just need to work on harder to language it better rather than just say, oh, look, that, that doesn't apply. This is the better one. Yeah, great. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, where I think we'll get um, just on this ongoing iteration, we're, we're getting the broad contours of a plan that's hard for us to understand what we're working on. And so we're trying to invite our intuitions to look at this biggest picture and see the pieces that would have to move. Um, Benson, on the six week plan, uh, the reason that I'm starting with this broader picture is because if everybody's not oriented to what we're doing, then it's hard to know what we're gonna do the next six weeks. So that was kind of the purpose to start from their backwards plan then we can take a slot of that and go, okay, based on what's immediately at hand, what can be accomplished over the next six weeks? And then we'll get into quick iterative cycles. Um, and then I'm also envisioning taking these other frameworks, uh, like the ones you've developed, like the ones, whatever that World Business Council, and those will start to form a critical path project schedule. And, and then we'll be able to see how we're moving along that. And Wendy, that'll get iterated, you know, every couple of weeks, at least monthly. So that keeps moving. Marianne? Yeah, I just wanted to make a note that um, a lot of the stuff that was in the um, chat did not get reflected in the board. Yeah. So kind of building on what Vincent and Forrest were saying, you know, there is so much <laughs> that's yeah. not there. But, you know, it's the first draft, and I think it was great that you just made us jump into the deep end. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Um, so if we were to, um, the last 30 or so minutes here, um, would you guys be willing to dive into a look at the next six weeks with me um, and kind of see what's immediately at hand and how these different pieces feel? And then, um, so that would be one thing. So how does that feel as a use of our, our next 30 minutes to try to get concrete on the next six weeks? Any Anybody significantly object to that? Okay, great. And then, um, I agree with Marianne what you just said. There, there's a lot there in the chat and a lot of processing of what we did get on the board. Um, would there be a couple of people that would be willing to schedule a time to work with me on kind of sorting out both going through the chat and then sorting out the, the board a little bit to get a better intuition and kind of tying that back into whatever we come up with for the next six weeks? Is anybody interested in that lift? Uh Actually, can I just ask for a moment's pause? My brain is yeah, like yeah. oozing out my ears. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so the questions you're asking are like not right. penetrating <laughs> my brain. Yeah, I love it. So Thank you, if we could just take a pause for a second. So the first, just to consider the first question in light of all that's gone on the board and the nice reflection. So your first question was, does it make sense? Does it feel right for the next 30 minutes to move into a what feels most alive for us to accomplish in the next six weeks. Was that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can we just take a breath? Just absorb the question and kind of see I need I need a minute to see what emerges just in response to that. Thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. I love that. Yeah. So I have a thought. I like what we did relative to, okay, let's dream big, right? Let's dream this whole thing is done and then pull back from there the pieces that we would need to have as our stepping stones to get from where we are to where we need to go. What I would love, what would feel really great from my perspective is to use time either now or in the next session to say what's most alive for people in the meeting that they're already working on rather than looking at the board and saying what seems most important on the board, which for me would be much more of an intellectual exercise and instead say what's already happening, where is there already movement, where is there already action, and I know, I'm guessing, Jordan, you know where a lot of those pieces are, but I'm guessing too that a lot of the people in the room don't see the fuller picture. It might be nice to share with each other, this is what I'm working on, and this is how I think it could relate to Meta Project, so that we're almost doing the opposite. Here's what's currently alive. Here's where we're going. Okay, which things now are starting to reach towards each other already? that with just a little more effort or a little more energy would just go cheek, would just connect them. Because yeah. I think the connections are happening already. And I would rather make this a heart-centered, meaningful, purposeful exercise instead of an intellectual exercise. Thank you, Wendy. Marianne? I agree with Wendy. Um, but I also feel we didn't finish this map. And we, the ground, the ground, we didn't do the ground. That's what we need to do next. So it feels like we need to take the next level down from the 5,000 feet to say, okay, this is the next step to do all that. So that will help. But again, Wendy, I totally agree. <laughs> we should be linking with what's going on and the energy that's already moving. Yeah. Okay, great. So, so we just had expression of the two things and I think it's 100% of both. So Marianne, what I heard you express is in, in my mind, we got, maybe just down to, you know, we kind of did the 50,000 foot level, but we didn't really clarify it. So we can do that. Mm -hmm. And we maybe got down to about the 30,000 square foot level and we didn't get any anywhere close, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think we got, um, so my second my second question, Wendy, do you have room for my second question? Okay. <laughs> so my second question was if a couple of people would have energy to help me process that board asynchronously and try to kind of clarify and place everything out, um, and then once we have a clean slate, I think coming out of that, our goal would get, be to get like a clear 30,000 foot level. And then we could schedule a session to drive the near term, like next quarter down to ground would be kind of my suggestion, Marianne. So that would give us that view. And then if we match that up with what Wendy's saying on, okay, and what are the streams of energy that are already present and emerging, then, then we could probably see how those met up. So how, how does it, does that approach sound okay to accomplish both sides of the kind of strategic and emergent together? Uh, Judy, I see you talking on mute. I think we probably could do some of that now, but I think we need a homework assignment between now and the next meeting in the sense of the, the complexity and depth with which this needs to be considered on multiple dimensions. And I think another question I have that I'd like us to address next week is how do we reach to the agency that is already in effect so that we're not creating from ground level things that perhaps exist already in other venues yeah. that could be partnered to address. And 
we need to think a bit, I think about the mechanics of how we connect the growing structure and the connectivity of other people to these initiatives and thoughts. Yeah, agreed. Great. Wendy and Wendy. Mm -hmm. Wendy. Um, my thought is that we as a community could, um, I don't want to use the word should, take on something at a sort of low level of granularity that's um, just a little experiment to our willingness to actually do something at a personal level. Because I think it's it's really good that we're working at, you know, a, a, an upper level and trying to land it for other people. But there's nothing like trying to change yourself at the same time you're, you're attempting to, to alter a situation in which other people might change. There's something about I'm going to do X, a commitment piece. Um, yeah. and it comes back to self action. And if you can't do that, then <laughs> it's a, there's yeah. a problem of the first order there. Yeah. It, okay, so so Wendy, I'm going to accept that homework. Um, and I think, I think we can get there maybe by so I, so I think if we combine some of these streams, if we if we finish this um, kind of strategic approach and, and can kind of see what, what could be done over the next six, 12 weeks, if we then look at the emergent streams of energy, then we'll have a really good lay of the land over the next six weeks. And maybe we can get there by next week, Wendy. And then I think that would be a really good idea to, to look at what you're saying and go, okay, what, what are the little things that each of us can engage and commit to and how do those stack up and you know how do we, so does, does that sound okay? kind of complete the framework and then maybe next week or, or so yeah. we'll get there i think so what it's, you're yeah it's about self-change as much as anything else yeah agreed, agreed. Can't, can't, can't do expect other people to even follow us if we can't do it for ourselves so yeah. i'm choosing yeah. something whether it's on on everybody else's board or not so it's about self-responsibility yeah. in relationships yeah beautiful thanks wendy wendy m I lost my train of thought. So I think I'll just put my hand down. Thank you. Okay, beautiful. So oh, let's, actually, let's. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, the thought yeah. came back. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, Jordan, I guess this is really directed for you and I, if the, a lot of the things people are saying are already incorporated in the flow that I put together on the master flow board. So including the commitment piece that Wendy Elfer was just talking about bringing in other resources that people were talking about, um, working to create partnerships, if partnerships are necessary in order to activate or enable some things. So I'm just throwing that out to the room too. I'm doing my best when I come away from these meetings. Part of the reason why my head explodes is not really because of what's happening in the meeting. It's because of all the connections my brain is trying to make to all the things, all the flows and things that I'm putting together in order to be of service to the group. So when the timing is right, there might be a nice time to share some of those pieces so that other people feel like these concepts are captured and that we're not yeah feeling like we're losing threads if they don't get, keep getting spoken into the room. I'm trying my best to capture them and put them down so that when we get to the right moment in time, they will resurface and we can trust that they will resurface and not get lost. So I'm just throwing that in there as a, as a parallel piece. Yeah, great, thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, I think, Wendy, I'd love to take Kind of what surfaced today i agree with you that i think we've reflected most of the logic um and and we can use it as a little mirror um maybe making adjustments and then when we present this back we could present both kind of the cleaned up board at the thirty thousand foot level and the process flow that'll help illuminate how people get progressively integrated and moved into agency and action so those two pieces will probably illuminate illuminate a lot also, J Jonathan had his hand up for a little while before. I don't know if you, Jonathan still want to talk. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, 
each of us has a passion. And I see this group as eager to gather that passionate energy and help integrate it into the whole. Um, and I, I find that a bewildering um, process. I, what am I trying to say? I think this is great. I think that Wendy McLean's suggestion that we identify the piece we want to work on, uh, I'm eager to see that happen. Okay, great. So let's let's take um, Wendy's suggestion and Jonathan's. I'm I'm sensing. I think we. I think that was. Uh, I, I want to say thank you for um, running through that experiment and um, orienting and kind of and kind of learning this process. And I think when we cl clear up the board and present it back, it it'll be useful um, in orienting. And I also know it's a lot to dive into. Just so so we can just kind of relax. Um, let's go to the board and stop doing what we were doing, and let's pick up on Wendy and Jonathan's um, thread. Now let's take. Uh, Let's see, sorry, I need to do a shared screen here. Okay, so let's kind of, um, so we all kind of have a feel for this and I feel like there is a fairly common intuition for how this will move, which is great. And Wendy, I think, um, yeah, I think it'll be really illuminating to connect this up to the flow and the actual process for integration and the starting that river. And then I also wanna just once again speak to Forest statement that there's been a lot of work done at like international levels on the big system stuff. So this kind of all will flow together, I think. So so let's pick up on Wendy um, and Jonathan's statement to go to kind of um, passion and what's alive because it'll be be less less energy draining here. Um, so let's take let's take ten minutes here um, and just highlight um, anything that's particularly alive for anybody or that's kind of emerging that um, kind of immediately over the next six weeks, um, you feel like might somehow tie in or lead, lead to some of these pieces. Um, and we'll just see, get anything on the board. And then um, Vincent, maybe I'm thinking maybe next week we'll dive into the um, kind of planning of the next steps based on, based on this deep dive and take a closer look at the next six weeks. Okay, so so Wendy, can I can I invite you to um, to just share share a little bit more about the the threads that um, are emergent for you that you you're seeing could advance some of this that we've been talking about a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for me to relate it to the pull exercise will take me a few minutes of silence to figure out the best way to do that. So see you want to go to someone else first, that's fine. Or yeah, yeah, um, okay. otherwise, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to share a couple, uh, just a couple things. Wendy, you're saying some people might not um, know, but so, so we have opportunity to launch in partnership with the, um, with the UN and Future Capital funds and contests around the SDGs um, immediately at hand. So, so that's a really fun opportunity that I think will create stories that'll help start to fuel engagement. Um, and we, so for instance, if some of these, these things are out there, um, if some of these things appear on the board and we're not sure how to do them, but we know they're critical first steps to to starting the whole movement and shift. Um, one thing we could do is, is we have 
clear opportunity to be able to articulate that and set up um, contests or other things that would draw the best ideas from around the world that then could be kind of progressively implemented quarter by quarter. So that's one emerging thread of energy that's um, really high opportunity. Um, to throw down another thing is a percentage of those flows uh, to infrastructure. So we've been we've had a lot of work happening, um, particularly in this group with infrastructure builders who have been working to lay out tools in advance of all this stuff being required. Um, so we have a pretty significant opportunity, I, I hope, over the next 90 days to um, activate a funding stream to fuel that infrastructure, which is a really exciting emerging energy flow that could change some things. Um, so those are just maybe a couple a couple things. I'm gonna throw on this board. I gotcha. um, <laughs> I'm gonna throw on this board this like Pete plus Jordan plus OFC plus future capital interest in markets. Um, is it, so if we if we imagine all this emerging energy, it's gonna to need to get matched up in marketplaces. And we've, we've got several um, places where energy is really important. Yeah, I see, I see increasing potential for partnerships. Right. So what's emerging behind the scenes is a is a recognition of how many people are interconnected by one degree, a separation. And I think there's going to be increased opportunity to capitalize on those interrelationships. So an example. Um, Graham Boyd is newly aware in my, in my mind just today is a, even though I'm not sure he's ever attended any of these meetings, but quite a few people in this group know him, know his work, have direct connection to him and is, and seems like an integral piece that then extends out and could help draw together some of the pieces here for more immediate activation because of the trust and connections that are already established. So that's what I, to me, that's like a low hanging fruit kind of thing. So that would, you know, that piece of it, which is the governance and financial piece, then draws in the technical piece, the um, connection piece. So, I, to me, that's very big, right? So I don't know if that's making sense to other people and I'm happy to describe it in more detail, but partnerships, I would say, as the overarching phrase for that. Yeah, great. Um, another one is choosing areas of focus. I think one of the things that we've been tripping over a bit as a group is not having an area of focus. And um, while I think that's been smart up until this point, as we focus on how we want to be together, how we form trust with each other, and how we do process, I think it's time um, to start moving towards action and picking areas of focus will help us practice acting on things together. So I see Meta Project being a place uh, an, an organization is not the right word, but a, a co collection of people that are trying to advance collective action together towards moving any piece down down the line, right? So it's not very well said yet, but if if we're focused on a process for collaborative action, then picking areas of focus will help us get better at that process of acting collaboratively together, which requires all the pieces in play. So I'm looking to improve that process by starting to pick areas of focus. And that goes back to the first one, which is the areas that are most alive for people, the things that are in greatest motion should be, in my opinion, our first areas of focus, because just improving the collaborative action piece is going to be hard enough and we should capitalize on the areas with the most momentum and the most energy 
in order to practice the other pieces. I see a parallel, a pa two parallel thrusts coming together, one being person to person, connections, relationships, partnerships, self-actualization, community actualization, becoming better versions of ourselves, all of that piece, the person to person piece in evolving in parallel with technological advancement in support of the person to person. So I'm seeing those developing in parallel and starting to meet now. Yeah. And so that's another kind of big, huge thrust that is beginning to happen. That is activating all this wonderful stuff. I feel like we've been talking about today, but I keep seeing them in those two main, like huge threads, huge pipes. Okay, I see other hands raised, I'll be quiet. Jonathan and Sheila. Um, <clears throat> Wendy's point and others as well. Um, the idea of collaborating, I think, is going to ask each of us to learn some new skills. Um, one of them could be encouraging other people's ideas to be developed. Uh, that's an emerging skill. I see us uh, learning together. Sorry. Stupid phone. Um, so education, skills acquisition. Uh, uh, there's some important how do you say, existing training that would help us a lot. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jonathan. Keila? Um, thank you, everyone. Of course, I always love what everyone's saying. And very much want to put a big exclamation mark behind what Wendy said in terms of following the momentum. And that is... I don't think I can emphasize enough from sort of my perspective and maybe training both as innovation funder, and that's a very particular kind of training where you really look at momentum and you experience that and you make funding decisions around that, as well as someone with, you know, some intuitive and soft skills and those types of trainings around what it means to be human in different ways, different cultures. And there is this notion of grabbing energy where it's at. Now, maybe we don't have enough skill to grab energy from the wind or grab energy from the water or do things that shamans do, but we can recognize where there is momentum and almost do the equivalent of grabbing energy of that. And it is actually a particular, it's a technology and a skill set, and it's not that hard to develop because it has more to do with how you see and knowing what to look at than anything else. And so if we notice what's alive and where there's momentum, we have so much more, I don't know how to say it in non-abstract terms. I mean, a shortcut abstractly would be we have a lot of help. But if I wanted to say it less abstractly, we're just more likely to succeed and find resources in ourselves and around us. And I, I think, probably many of us have had that experience, but you can use it as a tool, as a practical tool, not just as something that you talk about, you know, over a bottle of wine with someone. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kira. Judy? Just unmuting. I'm still sitting here thinking about what we can do as individuals, what we can do as what is now meta in its current existence, and what the potential is to connect to groups that are somewhere in the actualization timeline of already working on these things. Because I think all of these big issues 
do have many people around the world working on them and identifying what our role is or how meta can facilitate the flow of information or the connection of those actions um, to enable growing of action in many areas. You know, do we want to focus on growing the individual action through technology enablement that lets people connect and then do their thing wherever they are? That's certainly one powerful dimension but there's also the recognition that wisdom is ongoing in its development in other existing entities. And we could find that we're not keeping pace with the change in wisdom in important areas unless we have a mechanism to do that. Okay, beautiful. Okay, good. So so to, um, to kind of zoom out, we were able to, um, we were able to cover a lot of ground today. And um, thank you, I um, keep, keep losing this. Uh, but we were able to kind of, we were able to zoom out and, and take the big view. Um, we were able to spend 10 minutes kind of looking at those emergent nodes. And I think there's a good intuition for how those match up. We have, um, like Wendy pointed out, a lot of exciting partnerships and things converging right at hand that'll um, change what's possible definitely through transforming the size of the network and the, the people engaged. So um, anyway, thank you guys so much. So let's go to a quick retro um, in our last five minutes here. Um, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to get some some feedback and some learning on, on how that went and how we can do better. So. Um, let's do, okay, uh, Kilo, go ahead. I noticed that Pete didn't speak a lot and unfortunately he left, but I'd love to know how this was for people who didn't speak a lot. Yeah. One of the uh, difficulties when there's screen share is that at any given time, I can only see the few people who are participating the most. Um, so that's a that's something that I need to figure out facilitation for. I think you could actually have someone who took that role. I mean, I, I attempted to do it once, but I couldn't see who was talking more. I just sensed there were some of the views that were missing and perhaps my own a little as well. So there's something about being in a role and dedicating, committing yourself to that role and then having other people noticing for you um, what you're not able to notice for yourself. Yeah. Way to deal with that that works really well, planetary care is doing rounds because everybody knows they'll be asked all the time. So we just have to make sure they're short, not long, but just doing rounds because everybody gets a, a voice then and there's nobody who gets skipped. So it works really well. But to answer your question, I didn't say so much. I'm absorbing. <laughs> I'm just taking it all and drinking and drinking and drinking. <laughs> I couldn't even quite catch everything in the chat. It was so overwhelming, but I love it. <laughs> it's really challenging if you're trying to watch the mirror board and the chat. It's, it's almost like you need two screens, which can't yeah. this particular workstation I don't have. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I find the difference between the two screens is is really key as well, um, and, and having that. Uh, you know, I, I think the point that Vincent brought up um, was a really good point of learning relative to this type of experience, which is um, framing and, yeah. and really providing clear framing ahead of time of knowing where that is. And so that because the framing goes in to match uh, created expectations, if there are any, uh, that come in. Um, the other thing that I really appreciated, uh, Jordan, was you pausing after there was a lot of um, post-its on it and spending the good amount of time for the rounds for reflection uh, of the process there. That felt like a very rich and fertile um, opportunity to bring out um, the pieces of, of 
um, positive iteration. So, so we've got three minutes here. Let's let's do two quick sixty second um, waterfalls uh, just to just to close out. So, first one, let's drop into the chat. Um, just anything that particularly worked well or was was energizing or effective today on the first question, and then the second one will be what we can do better. So let's just focus on this first one. What worked well today? What was energizing? All right, and whenever you're ready, let's go ahead and waterfall those. Okay, and then um, last waterfall question, um, what can we improve on next time? Could we do better in the future or anything that felt frustrating or de-energizing? I guess let's frame it positively based up based on anything that was de-energizing. What can we do better in the future? All right, as we approach uh, three o'clock here, whenever you're ready, go ahead and drop those in. Beautiful. Thank you all. Really, really appreciate it. Ah, this is great. This is. Uh, good hard process and I love uh, being able to roll up our sleeves and do the work and um, I hope that over the next few weeks as we turn some of these working things into artifacts and shared understanding and move towards a little bit more structure um, some of these questions on what we're doing you know in each cycle and why and why it's the right thing and how the energy notes are meeting will, will make a lot more sense so anyway thank you such profound gratitude rich session so much to mine in the chat and I'm just really grateful. Thank you guys for being here. And once again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm hopefully speaking on behalf of many of us. Thank you, Jordan, for holding this and for experimenting and for the skill and the mastery and the heart, because we're all, we're all bringing it, but we're bringing it because, you know, again, you're leading it this way. And we're becoming stronger as each other, but I think it's also incumbent on us to really appreciate what the difference you make. So thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you, Keila. All right. I echo uh, Marianne's post to uh, good luck tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Tomorrow will be kind of a different process, but yeah, we'll, we'll learn how to do all this and get better and better. So, all right. Love you guys.
We'll see, see you soon. Bye.